Hey there, marketing research students. Welcome back to Marketing Research. In this lecture, we're going to learn how to define marketing research and explain how it's advantageous to do a marketing research-based approach to solving some common business problems. We're going to learn how to identify business problems that do call or don't call for marketing research. We're going to be able to explain and identify some of the common applications of marketing research. We're going to explain which of the three major forms of research is best suited for a specific marketing problem. We're going to learn how to distinguish between primary and secondary data and research. And we'll also be able to identify the marketing research process. Finally, we'll explain some of the common pitfalls that occur when we try to identify marketing problems. We'll give some common examples of these. When we define marketing research, it's probably useful to separate these into two separate ideas. Mind you, there's a lot of different definitions of marketing research. I, inc I encourage you to go Google a few different definitions provided by our, uh, different sources. First, one common definition of marketing, and one that I like because it's rather short, says that ma marketing is about managing profitable customer relationships. In other words, every single activity that we do in marketing, every strategy that we consider, every tactic that we engage in, all serves this greater purpose how we manage the lifetime relationship of a customer and do so in a way that is profitable to us, or in the case of a nonprofit, aligns with our objectives. Research, whether it's about marketing, finance, biology, or physics, is a systemat systematic inquiry to establish facts in an objective manner. The word systematic is very important. That means we must have a process when we conduct our research. Establishing facts. We're trying to determine what is or is not true and real. When we do this, we do this in an objective manner. By objective, I like to think of this uh, as being as impartial as possible. That is, a good researcher is completely indifferent to the conclusions that their research provides. Instead, the researcher is satisfied that the process itself led to an honest, objective answer. So this, con this converges on a common definition of marketing research. Marketing research provides managers timely, accurate, objective information and insight about current and potential customers. In other words, marketing research helps marketers do their job better. Our big assumption is that if we provide marketing managers timely, accurate, objective information, they'll be able to make the right decisions and take the right actions, and that'll tend to make their organization succeed. It's worth keeping in mind that this is not the only mechanism that can be used to inform decision making. Think about some bosses that you've had in jobs in the past. You may have noticed that some of the common ways that they went about making decisions were some of these techniques below. Just simply guessing, using their intuition, that thing sometimes called their gut instinct or their, their management gut. Monkey see, monkey do, or imitation. Just look at what your competitor or someone else who's successful is doing and just imitate them under the presumption that it must work well for you as well. Or you might just simply get lucky. And there's a bunch of other techniques for making decisions like these. Now, in this class, we're clearly going to be relying on the top approach there. But I don't mean to completely dismiss these other approaches. Every single one of these, every single one of these other approaches has something going for it. That is, they will tend to take less time, less money, and less effort than a marketing research-based approach. Based on the previous definition, it should be apparent that marketing research can be used for anything that might confront a marketer. However, it can be useful to organize some of these marketing research applications in systematic ways. In this next section, I provide you a few ways to do that. One way to organize marketing research is to consider the four primary pursuits that is, the types of problems that marketing research often tries to solve. First, identifying market opportunities and problems. Two, generating, refining, and evaluating potential marketing actions. Three, monitoring marketing performance. And then fourth, improving marketing as a process in of itself. I like to think of this as going from being completely lost, identifying opportunities and problems, as we see here, our little helmet representing us and we are not clear where we are in this crazy mapped area but if we are able to actually lay this map out now we have actually have an understanding of the landscape that might help us figure out where we should go 
For example, while we're busy identifying marketing opportunities and problems, we'll identify some things that might be poison and some things that might be valuable to us. Let's give an example of that. Consider this study from the medical field. In this study, 180 patients who were 60 or over and had long-term medical issues were asked to evaluate the health stakes of specific physical or cognitive disabilities. Specifically, for these different hypothetical cognitive or physical disabilities, the respondent was asked to evaluate whether they thought having this issue would be better or worse than death. But the results here are interesting. If you look on the far left-hand side, you'll see that over 50% of the respondents said that bowel and bladder incontinence would be worse than death, whereas being bound in a wheelchair or having moderate pain all the time or having to stay at home all day was typically rated much or somewhat better than death. Now, this research is clearly not specific to a specific marketing issue. However, at this stage in the marketing process, it could be useful for idea generation. Other medical research has shown that older adults tend to not report that they're dealing with bowel or bladder incontinence, and instead they just accept it as a normal part of aging. For a marketer, this could be an opportunity for service improvement. In other words, improving the bedside manner of doctors and nurses, encouraging situations where older adults are capable of expressing these types of issues that they're dealing with so that they get the care they need. Or, as another idea, this type of research could inspire product innovation. There's already some medications out there that treat different types of overactive bladders. Perhaps this type of research indicates that there could be a market for more of these types of products as this type of uh, debilitating issue is considered extremely negative by older adults. Another common pursuit of marketing research is to generate, refine, and evaluate potential marketing actions. In this situation, we already have a set of possibilities that we're willing to consider doing in terms of marketing, maybe a set of different strategies or def a couple different tactical options. Here, we're going to use marketing research to help us figure out which of those choices is likely to be the most productive. In my little visual here showing two different possible pathways to get to our goal, which one is better? Just one example of this would be using a research technique called conjoint analysis to find out how consumers are willing to make trade-offs between the price and product features. I'm going to give you the world's lightest introduction to a conjoint analysis style experiment. We'll do that by playing a little would you rather game. Imagine you or someone that you care about is in the market for an electric bike. Which of the following three options would you prefer? In all cases, every other feature about the bike is exactly the same amongst the three except for the ones that you see below. Would you prefer the one in the middle that has the longest lasting motor but costs the most money? Or would you prefer the one on the right that has the cheapest price, but it also has a very short warranty? Or maybe you prefer the one on the left that has a bit of a middle ground of all the options. A marketer confronted with figuring out how to mix the product features in the best way that still satisfies the need of the customer at a price that they will pay and meets our profit needs is the goal of a conjoint analysis. So like many other marketing research techniques, Conjoint analysis reduces the need to rely on assumptions in our marketing strategy. Remember, assumptions are just things that we presume to be true despite us not having explicit empirical evidence that supports it. In marketing, we always have to have some assumptions. Some things will never be known for certain and we can't conduct research about everything. But for those high stakes assumptions, those things that if we're wrong could have cataclysmic results, marketing research is often valuable. Another common pursuit of marketing research to actually monitor your marketing performance. In other words, once decisions have been made, you track to see how you perform so that you can learn and improve in real time or take evaluative actions at a later time to make better choices in the future. So in the little example here, we see a pathway was, was chosen based on the second primary pursuit of marketing research, but we, through monitoring marketing performance, we got a little off track. Let's give an example. An interesting article called What Makes a Television Commercial Sell Using Biometrics to Identify Successful Ads came from the Journal of Advertising Research in 2017. In this study, they wanted to determine if biometric tracking of consumers' responses to television commercials, specifically mostly candy bar commercials, helped explain which TV ads over and underperformed in terms of driving sales in regional markets. So what they did was they took 118 different advertisements from 20 different brands and then took a variety of biometric measures in laboratory of consumers. So biometric measures include things like facial tracking, looking for smiling, laughing, anger, eye tracking, seeing where their eyes moved while they were looking at the commercial, uh, heart monitoring, and so on. 
Then a third party company that already tracks ad effectiveness in the real world, uh, they have data on the estimated effect of these commercials in the real world in terms of driving sales in different markets. So they took the biometric data rating each one of the ads and they matched that up with third party data that already indicated whether or not an ad over or underperformed. The idea was maybe the biometric measures teach us and give us some indication about what type of advertisements tend to succeed and which ones tend to underperform. In this study, they found a few interesting things. First, at least in the case of these candy bar ads, biometric readings that indicated an ad was perceived as funny improves the chances of it being a successful ad. On the other hand, when the biometric trackers indicated that someone was not paying particularly close attention to an ad, over time. This actually increased the chances that it would be an ad that would fail. While some of these results may seem intuitive, what's important here is that these results show that actual biometric feedback, not just how people evaluated ads as being funny or boring, actually taught us a little more about how whether or not an ad would succeed. If you look at this chart here in the bottom right hand side, it indicates one of the findings. Notice on the, on the x-axis, running horizontally, we see 30 seconds. In other words, the spot for a 30 second ad. The dotted line represents poor ads, those ads that underperformed at driving sales in the marketplace. The thick black line indicated the three other type of ads, those that performed on average or in a superior manner. Those were the ones coded as a four. On the y-axis, we see that we actually have heart rate monitoring changes from baseline. So over time, take someone's given heart rate and see how it changes or alters as they move across an ad. What we see here is that poor ads, people's heart rates tended to actually decrease as a uh, as it changed across the baseline compared to the other ads where it stayed a little closer to baseline and then peaked towards the end this is an example of how biometric reading helped indicate exactly how someone was behaviorally responding to an ad and might indicate whether or not it fin is financially successful finally the fourth prim primary pursuit of marketing research is to improve marketing as a process overall if we understand and accept that marketing is actually a process it's not just an art the idea is that marketing research when integrating these first three primary pursuits can help us improve our ability to conduct marketing research in a rigorous fashion. This isn't the only way to categorize marketing research. If you look at your textbook, or if you just Google Smith and Album, some of the founders of Qualtrics, you'll see that they categorize surveys, one of the most common types of marketing research, into 20 different typologies. In other words, the point they're trying to make here is that marketing problems that we solve with research are so common, you can look at any given survey and categorize it into one of 20 different categories. We're not gonna cover all of those categories here, but to illustrate what they mean, let's take a look at these three. Number seven is a new product concept analysis survey. In other words, many marketers are confronted with the challenge of trying to figure out before they even produce a new product or service or app or whatnot, they really don't know what consumers uh, might like or what they might initially react to. Survey or experiments can be useful to screen some of these new product concepts. Their ninth uh, type of research uh, was a habits and uses surveys. It's pretty self-explanatory. For a given product category or lifestyle, these surveys are designed to figure out the sort of daily habits, weekly or monthly, that people do use related to their products or the way of living. So for example, if you are someone trying to sell a kayak, you might ask a lot about their leisure activities, especially those related to on the water. The final example that I'll show here is a price setting survey and elasticity of demand surveys. One of the most challenging things for a marketer to do is to figure out exactly what the optimal price of a product should be so that it maximizes profitability. This is a particularly challenging when the product hasn't been brought to market yet or there's not a lot of empirical evidence already available. In these situations, surveys and experiments can be useful to find how consumers respond to different price points for a given product or service. Another way to characterize research is to categorize it as either basic or applied research. In reality, this is a false dichotomy. Most research falls somewhere along a continuum of these two things, but it's useful to think of these as two separate things for the moment. Basic research is the kind of research that I think of as being more science or academic-y. That is, it's trying to answer broad, general truths about how humans behave in the world. On the other hand, applied research is a little more immediate and pragmatic. There's usually a very specific marketing problem confronting a very specific business or industry, and a study was set out and designed to answer that question very specifically. Downside. For applied research projects, they may not be really interested in answering broad, general truths about how humans behave in the market. Let's give some examples. Here's an example of applied research from Nielsen. You may actually want to Google this craft beer shelf buster study. It's a really fun website, and you can actually interact with a lot of the survey results and guess to see how much you understand about the craft beer marketplace. This study was done in 2016, and what it set out to do was to find out how craft beer consumers interact and react to different types of packaging decisions for craft beers. Just highlighting one of the results here on the bottom right hand side, uh, one of the survey questions that was asked of respondents in this particular study was when choosing a craft beer, 
which physical attributes of the package tend to make the strongest impression on you. If you look at the bottom there, the design of the package itself and where it was produced were the two most commonly selected items. Hmm. Looks like that local home field advantage that's sometimes talked about in the craft beer industry is alive and well. Now, this research can be very useful and very practical for anybody who's interested in selling or consuming craft beer, but it might not give us broader truths about how packaging and how consumers react to them in the marketplace. Another example of applied research comes from an interesting company called Adormi. Adormi is an online lingerie company, but they're also like extremely data-driven. Uh, you may again want to read this article uh, coming, coming from Fast Company that talked about all the different ways that Adormi uses AB, or un in other words, online experiments to figure out what sort of content does the best job at selling, uh, selling lingerie products. Of course, keep in mind, if you do any Googling to search about Adormi, you're going to see pictures of people in lingerie, so choose as you will if you find it's appropriate to check that out. But what's interesting here is rather than just guessing about the best way to pose a model or the best type of model to have wear a particular piece of lingerie to sell it online, what they do with Adore Me is they try multiple different variations and then randomly show those different variations to consumers and see how people react. In other words, do they buy, do they buy products more frequently when a model is sitting or standing? Uh, an interesting quote directly from the article, through its research, Adormi has found that the right model matters even more than the price. If customers see a lacy push-up on a model they like, they'll buy it. Put the same thing on a model they don't, and even a $10 price cut won't compel them. That's clearly a very important insight for Adormi. That would suggest putting more time, energy, and resources on finding the right type of model to put into the picture at the, with the hope that they don't have to reduce price to actually move product. Let's take a look at basic research. Basic research in marketing often comes from academics. A lot of peer-reviewed journals publish marketing articles. The Journal of Marketing, Journal of Marketing Research, amongst many, are some of the most popular. Basic research also often comes from industry groups, or it may come from marketing research firms in the real world looking to answer broad questions, such as Nielsen. This article from the Journal of the Association for Consumer Research called Call Me Raleigh, The Role of Brand Nicknames in, Nicknames in Shaping Consumer Brand Relationships, provides an interesting insight for a wide array of marketers. In this study, they wanted to see how different consumers reacted to uh, brands when the nickname for the brand was used rather than its formal name. In a laboratory experiment, researchers found that brand nicknames, for example, like Wally World rather than Walmart, uh, when the brand nickname was highly relevant to the brand, it increased purchase intentions of the brand. So if you look over here at the chart on the right hand side, Notice that the dotted red line indicates when the formal name for a brand was used, and the blue line indicates when the nickname for the brand was used. The y-axis indicates how much someone's reactions uh, regarding purchase intentions towards that brand. Notice that when the nickname was used in the highly relevant brand nickname condition, people were much more expressed much higher intentions to actually purchase the product. Now what's important here is that these researchers set out to answer broad, general questions about how humans process and interact with nicknames. In fact, the theories that they drew from actually first started with how people talking to other people react to nickname use rather than formal names. So these, this research doesn't directly tell Target whether they should refer to themselves as Target or Walmart might refer to itself as Wally World, but it does provide interesting insights that could be useful to a wide array of marketers. Here's another example. An article was published called On the Reception and Detection of Pseudo-Profound Bullshit. This is a real article, by the way, from a peer-reviewed journal. In this article, they defined bullshit in an academic sense. They said bullshit, in contrast to mere nonsense, is something that implies but does not contain adequate meaning or truth. As an example, attention and intention are the mechanics of manifestation. Essentially, the, ar the author's definition tried to argue that bullshit claims are those kind of things where they are technically sentences and they have content, but they mean something so wide and so diverse and so broad to such and so idiosyncratic to every person reading it, it doesn't really have any uh, concrete meaning. In this study, what they tried to do was they tried to figure out what kinds of people are more prone to accept pseudo-profound bullshit. In other words, what type of personality traits predict the type of people who are more likely to find pseudo-profound bullshit to have meaning versus those types of people who are less likely to think it has deep meaning? Here's some other examples. We exist as electromagnetic resonance. To traverse the path is to become one with it. In this study, they presented people with a whole bunch of different so-called pseudo-profound bullshit statements, have them ranked, have them ranked and scored how profound they thought those statements were, 
In addition, they also took a bunch of personality measures, and then they took the correlations. You may recall for correlations, a correlation of 1 means perfect positive relationship. A correlation of 0 means there is no linear relationship between the two concepts. And a correlation of negative 1 indicates that there's a negative linear relationship between the two concepts. And here's what they found. Looking at the top row here, they found that people, as people scored higher on the ontological confusion scale, they were also more likely to score high on the bullshit receptivity scale. Um, ontological confusion is defined as the degree to which a person confuses literal and metaphorical truths. Uh, as an extreme example, if I was to say it's uh, raining cats and dogs, um, it's not literally raining cats and dogs. So, in other words, if people uh, conf the more they confused literal and metaphorical truth, it appears as though they might be more inclined to accept this so-called pseudo-profound bullshit. Uh, on the other hand, look near the bottom there, as people scored higher on verbal on a verbal intelligence, this is a standard test sort of um, assessing the degree to which someone um, successfully links synonyms together. Um, as, as someone scores higher on verbal intelligence, it's negatively correlated uh, with so-called bullshit receptivity. And then in the middle there, you may notice that paranormal beliefs, faith and intuition, and religious beliefs are all positively correlated with so-called pseudo-profound bullshit receptivity. So. This is a basic research study. This study in of itself clearly has no explicit direct recommendation for any marketer. However, perhaps this type of study could be useful to a marketer. When marketers are confronted with interesting basic research results, we're often asking ourselves, well, if these results are true, how might they apply to our unique circumstance? For example, imagine that you were a marketer interested in selling so-called healing crystals um, at a flea market. If these results are actually true, as presented here, how might that indicate what types of phrases, terminology, and content you might include in order to sell those so-called healing crystals? Another way of describing types of marketing research is to recognize the differences between exploratory, descriptive, and causal research, and identify the difference between primary and secondary data or research. First, let's quickly d distinguish between primary research and secondary research. Primary research is that research that you conduct yourself for a very specific purpose. In other words, with the research question that you have, you design the study, you collect the data, you analyze the data, and you present the results. Secondary research, on the other hand, is that research that was produced by somebody else, but you intend to make use of it. Of course, this is often quicker, faster, and more convenient. The frustration about secondary research is often that it may not be perfectly designed for your needs, and you must make an informed judgment about whether or not it's still appropriate. Exploratory research is that kind of research where your research question is often a little bit ambiguous. Uh, you're trying to gain background information, define terms, clarify problems and hypotheses. In other words, you know that there's something worth studying, but you're still so unclear about what exactly is going on, you really aren't able to formalize a precise research question yet. So let's give an example of exploratory research in a primary research example and a secondary research example. So a primary research example might be um, shadowing various business-to-business -business sales teams in an organization develop a, to develop a broad understanding of the teamwork habits, sales techniques, and common pitfalls. So in this situation, clearly, um, if you are a, in a B2B sales situation, uh, knowing how your sales teams behave, interact, perform is very important. But in this situation, if you're simply shadowing them, you're just looking um, open-mindedly to a variety of different things they may do. You don't know precisely what you're looking for yet. You're looking for those aha moments, things that might intrigue you. As a secondary research example, maybe you analyze recorded customer service calls to develop an understanding of triggers that escalate or diffuse irate customers. So imagine if you're the manager of a call center, and no surprise, a lot of times people call in and are rather upset. An interesting question might be, what are those specific phrases that your service reps use that tend to seem to induce or diffuse uh, customers becoming really angry. If you just explore those service calls, you could maybe document and observe any intriguing observations that you might make about when those things occur. Then later, you could follow that up with more rigorous study. Descriptive research is the type of research where your, your main intention is to quantify something. I think of it as who, what, where, when, and how. For those of you who took an introductory journalism class, you'll notice I said all of them except for why. Descriptive research is when we want specific, rigorous quantities, percentages, counts, correlations, differences in averages, and so on. 
It's my experience. I think when new marketing researchers think about typical marketing research, they're often thinking about descriptive studies. So as a primary research example, imagine we collect survey data to understand common cell or smartphone usage behaviors amongst teens by age, gender, and phone type. In other words, do younger teens tend to use different apps than older teens? Or maybe iPhone teen users play different games than Android users. As a secondary research example, we could be analyzing U.S. Census data to develop market segments based on geography and income. So what do we do if we actually want to answer a why question? We actually want to know what causes some other thing to happen. And when you think about marketing, in the end, everything really boils down to a why question. As marketers, we are very interested in understanding why people do things, because we make interventions to try to change or alter their behaviors. If I do this, then how will my consumer or customer respond? If we want to do causal type research, we really only have one option. Experiments are really the only tools available to us to truly investigate causal questions. So as an example, for primary research, maybe we conduct a conjoint analysis, it's a type of experiment, to determine the optimal bundle of attributes to offer for a new touchscreen laptop. In other words, we know everybody wants the best memory, the best battery life, the best keyboard, and the best screen. We don't know exactly what price we can sell that at, and we know that we would much rather make sure that at a given price point we give people the features they do want and maybe make some trade-offs on the other features that aren't as important so that we can make sure we have a nice profit. Now for secondary research, it's a little harder to come up with good causal research examples because you have to do an experiment. When you're, looking, when you're looking at data that already exists out in the real world, sometimes it's trickier to actually find examples of experiments. But some things that we do uh, is something called a natural experiment. In other words, a natural experiment is simply, rather than a formal experiment that we do ourselves, something spontaneously happens in the real world that we argue, and again it's rhetorical, um, or that, that, somebody, that something that happened out in the environment actually effectively makes something like an experiment. In other words, we have a treatment and a control, and we intend to compare those results. So an example of this might be, we want to see how our, competitive react, how our competitors react to, to our various marketing actions. We're going to treat those competitive reactions as, as essentially experimental treatments and see how those, different, how those differences in their reactions impact our effectiveness. Again, this isn't really an experiment, but rather we're arguing it qualifies as an experiment. Okay, we're pretty much ready to wrap up this introduction here to marketing research. Um, a couple things that we should keep in mind now that we've introduced some of the basics. Remember that marketing research is an applied science. In other words, people who conduct marketing research should always keep in mind that there should be some sort of practical, pragmatic purpose they're trying to address. Also, we've introduced lightly a variety of different research design choices through this introductory conversation. Keep in mind that the correct research design for any given marketing question is always a function of choosing the right design based on the problem that we need to address. What often concerns me and what often happens in the real world is that marketers become skilled with, say, survey design or online A-B experiments. And because they become skilled at that design, they start trying to address every marketing problem with that specific design. If you look at this poor gentleman down here, clearly he's using the wrong tool for the job that he's confronted with. As marketing researchers, we're going to try to avoid this. We're going to try to not, we're always going to try to make sure that we pick the right marketing research tool for the problem we're trying to address.